You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views, and interviews in association with FE News. Hello, everyone. May the 4th be with you. And if the unofficial holiday of the Star Wars franchise is not your thing today, then there's always the only community radio show on the internet, connecting the world of FE. We're now hitting the dizzy heights of nearly 2,000 regular downloads since the show began, just over a week ago. And tonight, we've got just the content and the lineup of guests to kickstart your working from home, working from week, in Skills World. So... Close down those open windows in Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Shut down that email inbox. Tell that annoying line manager you're no longer available. And let the Skills World Live team bring you all topical debate with the odd uplifting track from our independent music site of choice, epidemicsound.com. That's right, folks. During the lockdown and the COVID-19 crisis we're all living through, this community radio DJ, Tom Buick is committed to holding the highest people in the land to account. Tonight on the show, I'll be talking to the Skills and Apprenticeship Minister, Gillian Keegan. And in the interests of impartiality and political balance, I'll also be talking to the new Shadow Minister, Labour's Toby Perkins, as well. In the phone chat section of the show, I'm delighted that two experts will be debating with me tonight's big debate theme – Why has so much fuss been generated about the apprenticeship starts statistics? And stay tuned for the final stages of the show. With absolutely every expense spared, we'll be powering up the transatlantic bat phone once again on Skills World. This time, I'll be talking to the guru of American apprenticeships, Dr. Robert Lerman of the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. But first, let's find out what's making the news headlines in the world of FE this evening. Ministers at the Department for Education have announced a package of financial measures for universities that will result in a cash injection of £2.6 billion. The student loans company said that they would bring forward the tuition fees that they pay to higher education institutions to help with the university's cash flow. Dame Julia Buckingham, president of the lobby organisation Universities UK, cautiously welcomed the move but warned ministers that further measures would need to be put in place to ensure that the sector was able to support economic and social recovery through research and innovation, she said. In a related announcement, the higher education regulator... The Office for Students said that it was prepared to impose substantial financial penalties on universities that changed their admission strategies because of the financial pressures associated with the pandemic. In other news, the Department for Education has published a list today of 576 qualifications in sectors that will attract premium course funding in future. The £400 million funding scheme will provide an uplift in course fees in the areas of manufacturing technologies, engineering and ICT. A DFE spokesperson said that the Level 3 qualifications offered by awarding bodies, like City and Guilds and Pearson, were crucial to boost the future productive capacity of the economy. And finally, a Harrogate College teacher is supporting a local group in the production of scrubs for NHS workers. Annabelle Smith program manager for MA Creative Practice has sewn three scrubs for frontline care staff across the district as part of a a community group called Harrogate Scrubbers. Launched by Fran Taylor, a teacher at St John's Fisher's High School, the group aims to address the increased demand for scrubs during the global pandemic. Since setting up the Facebook group three weeks ago, the page now has over 680 members, including a strong network of sewers and delivery drivers to support key workers in the area. Annabelle told this programme that the community spirit sparked through Harrogate Scrubbers was, well, inspiring. Contact us at Skills World Live. 
email skillsworld at fenews.go.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Tom Buick at FE News. Use the hashtag skillsworld. Call us on 02032 900 treble one. That's 02032 900 treble one. the first track of the evening from our friends over at the independent music website epidemicsound.com no relation i'm told to the current pandemic that's a track called wear me out by gamma skies now tonight's big debate is on the theme of falling apprenticeship starts what is all the fuss about i say fuss because there are many critics in the sector who say the emphasis for too long has been on boosting inputs, the numbers game, instead of improving outcomes that apprentices achieve. Recent data shows, for example, that achievement rates by providers have slipped by 2% to an average performance of 64%. That's just barely above the level where the government has the power to intervene and close a training provider down. 
This comes as concerns grow about the overall quality and scope of the English apprenticeship model, which is something we discussed on this programme only last week. Compared year on year to the end of February 2020, level two starts for the under 25s are down by 15%. Level 3 starts are down by 13% and higher level apprenticeships, that's levels 4 to 7, are down by 6%. Crucially, very little of this decline can be attributed to the coronavirus since the data relates to the period prior to the full lockdown. Sector leaders now worry that apprenticeship starts will fall off a cliff and want to see the government carry on publishing the data so it can be monitored more carefully. I spoke to the Skills and Apprenticeship Minister in a pre-recorded interview earlier and I put some of these challenges to her. And due to some technical reasons in the pre-record, folks, apologies in advance, but the quality of the sound on this piece is not up to our usual standards. Gillian Keegan, can we start by clearing up um, some of the confusion about the Apprenticeship Data Services Bulletin that the government publishes? Last week, the .gov website announced that these regular bulletins were being cancelled, uh, at least until November. Then, within 24 hours, an amendment to the site was made suggesting the government was uh, backtracking on that decision. Why was that? Um, Well, there was no um, sort of big announcement or backtracking. Basically, um, we will continue to publish headline statistics. um, but what we'd done previously is we'd advertised dates that we were going to be um, uh, publishing those on, um, and and actually it was just it was just straightforward really that in response to coronavirus and the pandemic, um, there there probably are some delays in terms of getting some of the data from various sources. So right, I see. we basically put in place a temporary measure which said you know we're not going to be doing that on these dates. Um, and we're going to, um, you know, be, be compiling the data in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, but there's no intention um, to not publish apprenticeship starts. I mean, we've been publishing them for I don't know how long. And <laughs> there's, you know, of yeah. course, the sector we all need to know and need to look at apprenticeship starts. Um, so, I mean, the communication may not have been uh, the best in the best order, but certainly right. there's no intention to not to, to, to not publish uh, information. Okay, well, that's definitely, I think, cleared up some of the confusion that was out there. In fact, you know, uh, as ever in the skills world, there's always the odd conspiracy theory that there's somehow a decision, first of all, made by officials and then it was overruled by ministers. But I think you've been very clear on the line this evening um, what the position is. Uh, Moving on to starts then, I mean, how concerned are you as skills and apprenticeship uh, minister of the continued fall in starts? I mean, they are well below now the pre-levy 2017 numbers and indeed they started to decline in the last quarter even before the current lockdown crisis began uh, yeah i mean i think i would take that question in in two parts sure pre-coronavirus how worried was i about the falls in apprenticeships um probably um you know not not necessarily um that worried because we deliberately had introduce some reforms into apprenticeships, um, which meant they're longer, they're more rigorous, there's quality is now assessed by independent organisations. And the result of that has meant, you know, that there's been a slight decline in starts, you know, some people were exiting the market, etc. But as a result of that, we were getting a much uh, higher quality um, apprenticeship. And I feel very strongly um, about, you know, every young person um, deserves to have a high quality apprenticeship. So I was less worried because the quality was going up uh, with some of the numbers going down. However, that's that's the pre-corona um, uh, answer. I am extremely worried about um, the impact on apprenticeship starts as a result of coronavirus. Okay. Uh, clearly, many businesses um, that take on a great number of apprentices or even just a number of apprentices but by a sector it adds up to a lot of businesses um, are um, going through unprecedented times they've had their sort of income uh, turned off almost overnight they're, they're making all kinds of decisions and you know i am worried that um, you know new starts on apprenticeships will be uh, you know further down the list than some of the other business decisions they have to make at these in these in these unprecedented times so I think one is about the overall kind of what was happening after we we introduced the quality reforms and I would always always um, um, prioritize 
quality over quantity always because each 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 apprenticeship is a young person okay. uh, or, or even an older person's life opportunity really to to you know to, to get on in the workplace so that has to be high quality yeah. um but the post you know the, the the impact of coronavirus is extremely worrying and you know there is no doubt it will have an impact on apprenticeship starts Okay, well, let's come on to that in a moment. I mean, you talk there about the focus of the government being on quality, not quantity. But when you look at the profile, you know, the breakdown of the starts uh, of people taking apprenticeships in England today, does it concern you that the only area where the numbers appear to have been growing is for those existing employees who are often over the age of 25 uh, and well-paid managers doing MBAs who, until November at least, will be able to continue to enjoy those uh, high-level courses at, at taxpayers' expense. Well, actually, I think I think that question's uh, slightly confused. So the first thing is, am I worried that um, uh, that, that people are getting the opportunity to use an apprenticeship to upskill or retrain uh, if they're in a business? No, I'm not. Um, you know, having been somebody who you know, did an apprenticeship in a business and, you know, went all the way through the levels up to level six. Um, you know, I think it's a, a great uh, way into the workplace and, you know, it's something that, that is, it's, it's, it's a good way for businesses to make sure they have the skilled employees um, sure. that they need. So so that's specifically. Now, you, you kind of added in the MBA bit as well. I must say, I, you know, the, the, there is a review going on about the MBA apprenticeships in particular. Um and I was I was a, a slightly surprised um, to see to see the MBA apprenticeship when I uh, turned up at the job two months ago because I did did go on to do um, an MBA equivalent actually it was at London Business School a, a right. stone fellowship uh, it was a very expensive qualification but you know it wouldn't have ever struck me that I could have used a, an apprenticeship route to do that you know I obviously I paid for that myself or you know quite often the model is you pay for half and your employer pays for half and I've indeed sponsored many employees to, uh, to to do their MBA in that way. So I was slightly surprised actually to see it there as an apprenticeship. Um, but that's a review that's going on at the moment, um, which, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at it to see whether that is good, good value for money or not. Yeah. But that's very separate from the, you know, the, the, the young person, I don't know, 25 year old, I think you use the example, using an apprenticeship to upskill um, and, and, and even retrain. You know, there's some amazing examples of people who've worked for many years in a business, um, potentially in, in a, a job that uh, was really just a job. Um, and they've, they've been given the opportunity to do an apprenticeship. And I met somebody recently in our local hospital who's been a... Um, um, a cleaner actually in the hospital for a long time, yeah. 20 years I think she said, and she's just completed her uh, apprenticeship uh, to be a paediatric nurse and you know that is a, a, you know exactly what the, the scheme is there for. Right. You said earlier that uh, obviously the government's intention is for a higher quality programme and indeed the, the new standards that have been introduced over the past uh, few years are evidence of that. But they have been running alongside uh, the old apprenticeship frameworks, which I think most uh, people in the sector accept uh, is a kind of inferior product to the standards. There is some talk, though, that uh, the old frameworks could be extended, despite the fact the Institute uh, put the sector on notice last summer that these would be switched off by August the 1st. Where is the government on the whole issue of extending frameworks beyond the July 31st deadline? Well, you know, a, a lot of the sort of uh, old frameworks have already moved to standards. I think we're over 75% now are already on standards and, you know, and that's, that's continuing. And we think a lot of the sector are, are, you know, have been ready, as you say, they've been given 18 months notice, I think, of this impending change. So, you know, much of the sector is is, is on, on course to do that. However, you know, of course, we are going to be reviewing things in light of, of coronavirus and, you know, I'm waiting to see advice on that. But from what I understand, a, a, a lot of sectors already have moved. I think pretty much all sectors have examples where they've moved to standards. So I think, you know, there's, there's great leadership being shown and it looks like the vast majority of the of the sector have been able to, to, to do this so um, and, and are continuing to do it now. So it, it looks like, um, you know, as you usually get in this case, you know, there may be a few laggards at the end, but the, right. the vast majority are uh, on course to, to, to do this. Um, 
<laughs> and you know, as you say, standards are um, well recognised as being um, you know of a higher quality, and certainly you know have have a lot more confidence of employers and businesses. And 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 that's the most important thing. Is that, you know, if we don't move to this, then then effectively a young person is doing potentially an apprenticeship that that employers may not have the same view of um, in terms of uh, understanding the quality of it. So I think it's very important. I always look at this from the young person, from the learners, from the apprentice's viewpoint. What's best for the apprentice? As soon as we can get onto standards, it's much better for the apprentice. Julian Keegan, England Skills and Apprenticeships Minister. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming on Skills World this evening. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. That was the skills minister there, Gillian Keegan. Now, don't go away, folks. After this short musical interlude, I'll be discussing the whole Apprenticeship Starts issue with the new Shadow Minister responsible, Toby Perkins, MP. That was We Could Run Away, uh, Yesable with Mia Stegmar. Now, just to remind you, there will be no usual Skills World Live show with guests on Friday the 8th of May here in the UK because it is a public holiday. The nation will be celebrating, now in lockdown at home, of course, those Victory in Europe commemorations. However, to get the mood off to a party atmosphere for the bank holiday weekend, I'll be swapping my alter ego on Friday with DJ Van Allen by providing a one-hour continuous mix of some of the best tunes from that independent website, epidemicsound.com. Now, don't miss that if you like a bit of disco and house music in your home on a Friday evening. Now, joining me 
To continue, tonight's big debate theme is the new Shadow Minister for Apprenticeships and Lifelong Learning, Toby Perkins, who joins me on the line now. Good evening, Mr Perkins. Thanks for joining Skills Hi, World Dave. Live. Hi, good evening. Good to, good to speak to you. Great. And to you. Thanks indeed for joining. Now, look, the government clearly backtracked on the apprenticeship stats releases. Uh, do you welcome what uh, ministers have subsequently decided to do? Well, well, yeah, of course. I mean, I was calling on them to do it. Of course, so yeah. I can't very well complain uh, when they do. So, I mean, I, I just think that at this moment in time, um, everyone recognises that there's huge um, challenges facing the sector, and I don't think we resolve those challenges by just hiding uh, the information uh, away. So um, I thought it was uh, a, a, a very concerning step when the announcement was made, and, and I'm very much welcome. Uh, the fact that whilst accepting that uh, ESFA uh, have much to do, um, it, it was uh, it was really great that they um, did announce in, in the end that they would continue with the uh, statistics release because you know I think particularly as we move forward into the autumn, um, the you know and we already saw in the February figures um, uh, the, the beginnings of uh, of a you know a reduction in in starts. Um, that we have that information so that uh, all of us in the sector can ensure that when, when the government are making their choices about the many, many priorities facing them, um, that the potential um, crisis in, in apprenticeship starts is one of those that's getting the attention it deserves. Okay. Well, you're back on the front benches again after a spell on the back benches under Jeremy Corbyn. How do you see Labour policy on apprenticeships and lifelong learning developing under your under you and your new leader, Keir Starmer? Um, I mean, I think we, we see um, apprenticeships and, and the whole skills agenda is absolutely central to the kind of country um, that Britain needs to be post-Brexit. You know, if, we, if we're going to see reductions in uh, the number of migrants coming into the UK, it's going to be all the greater pressure uh, on us as an economy to ensure we're maximising the skills of every person that we've got here. And I think that um, you know, the technological developments that we're going to see mean that the ability for people to be able to um, retrain and, and continue to sort of pivot within their careers um, is, is never going to have been more important. And so, um, you know, in terms of, uh, of this policy area, um, there's a huge commitment to uh, ensuring that the apprenticeship levy delivers on, on what was intended for it, to ensure that um, apprenticeship providers, uh, quality apprenticeship providers, um, continue to offer real choice both to employers um, and to, uh, to to apprentices, um, and that people at every stage of their um, journey through adulthood uh, are able to access the, the skills that they need in order to, to maximise their own ability. So, I mean, I see it as absolutely fundamental to um, Labour beliefs and, uh, and and what the Labour Party was set up to uh, uh, to represent, which, of course, was working people. OK. As an opposition, can you tell our listeners what you will be pressing the government on over the coming weeks? I mean, for example... Does the Labour Party support the Association Employment Learning Providers' legal challenge of uh, ministers yeah, of the Department yeah, for I mean, Education? We, yeah, yeah, entirely. I mean, we we um, feel very strongly there is uh, a moral uh, obligation um, and an absolutely practical um, necessity on on behalf of the government to ensure that those apprenticeship providers um, that uh, happen in some cases, to be providing apprenticeships to people um, who, who are paying for it via the apprenticeship levy um, to get the same protections as those who are outside the levy. It's just a logical distinction to make. Um, I, I am no lawyer, but um, uh, I'm, I'm led to believe that there is a strong um, body of opinion behind the idea um, that uh, the government's position will, will be found um, to flout the, the guidance. Um, that may remain to be seen, uh, whether that gets as far as, uh, as the courts. Um, but if it does uh, take a long period of time, then I'm afraid it will be too late for many providers in the industry, whatever the outcome is. And so I would absolutely call on the government to, um, to secure the funding of, of apprenticeship levy um, people are providing apprenticeships under the apprenticeship levy the same as those who are outside of that. 
Um, so that's that's one absolute key yeah. priority. Okay. But I think there's a second, um, you know, equally uh, important priority, which is for government to recognise the magnitude of this moment, to take a realistic view uh, about the scale of the um, uh, need for for industry change and, and career change that we anticipate is likely to affect many people. Um, and also recognise the huge needs that we have within things like our care sector um, and assist people to move from one uh, area to the other. Um, and so I think in terms of the uh, the plan for further education and for skills funding um, in this immediate next sort of six months, uh, we really need to see government working hard on, on an alternative um, plan so that if we do see the sort of wide-scale job losses that some have predicted, that people, that we can capture people as early as possible in that period of unemployment, get them uh, retrained and, and delivering in the areas where our economy really needs them. So, uh, I mean, I think this is this is not a moment um, for uh, uh, for modesty. This is a moment for the government to really um, step up and and uh, work okay. with the sector. Um, which has got so many talented people in, um, mm-hmm. to deliver on, on the skills uh, revolution that's necessary. You referenced there the, the post-COVID uh, recovery sort of type plan. Then, So what so what would Labour as an opposition actually support? For example, if the government was to bring forward uh, a version of the job retention scheme, but you know, kind of um, an apprenticeship uh, recruitment and retention scheme, which would still potentially cost significant amounts of money, probably more than the £2.4 billion currently earmarked from the apprenticeship levy in England. Would the opposition support that kind of investment? I mean, I, well, I, I don't want to get into sort of, um, you know, with great respect, half-baked um, sure. sort of proposals, but, and, and it, may, it may cost £3 billion and, and it, we can describe it in 20 seconds. What I would say is, is there's absolutely a need to support um, apprenticeship providers, to support the FE sector, and absolutely to support um, two generations of apprentices, those who are currently already on the journey and those who are about to come um, in September. We, we will look to work really constructively with government um, on any ideas uh, along those uh, along those lines. Um, and um, you know, but but what precisely those. Um, those solutions up there we would have to see what was proposed okay it sounds like you're going to be a constructive opposition at any rate um toby perkins yeah yeah, the shadow minister for apprenticeships and lifelong learning thanks for joining the show this evening yeah great to speak to you thanks so much call us today at skills world live dial 02032 900 travel one
goes, can you feel me? From epidemicsound.com. I know I keep on plugging this independent uh, artist's website, but it's really important during the coronavirus lockdown that we support our freelancers and our artists out there. And that's precisely what this show is all about. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by actually somebody who's pretty well known to the sector. He writes a lot on the fenews.co.uk website, and he's the Apprenticeships Director at Kaplan Financial. Good evening, Richard Marsh. Good evening, Tom. How are we doing? I'm very well, thanks. Now, I would, I'd hope to be joined by a colleague of yours at the wonderful London School of Economics, but the Vegas are doing a live programme. I just wasn't able <laughs> to get in touch. But I'm sure you've got plenty to say yourself on the theme of tonight's big debate, which is apprenticeship starts, what's all the fuss about? I mean, Richard, what, from your perspective, because you've shared your thoughts recently in writing on the FE News website, uh-huh, uh-huh. what do you think's more important now? Is it is it getting all into a tangle about the number of starts, or do we just need to focus on achievement rates of the ones that are uh, in the system now but also mm. look to the crisis ahead of us which is about frankly recruiting apprentices in future yeah and I've, I've yeah, I enjoyed the debate earlier and I've, I've been looking at the, the various comments that have been online around this and I think really Tom we've got to try and do both right? so we've got people who are finishing school or A levels or something this summer and we had their heart set on doing an apprenticeship. Perhaps they've not done a UCAS application or turned down jobs because they want an apprenticeship. And we've really got to find a way of making sure there is an apprenticeship for them this September if they were expecting one. Longer term, we've got to really focus, as you say, on, on the achievement and I think finding a better way of measuring and rewarding high-quality apprenticeships um, that doesn't punish half the providers in the system, which is what the current set of measures seems to seems to be doing. So, so what do you put the, I was going to say poor achievement rates, but that's too pejorative. I mean, let's just state them as a fact. So they've slipped by 2% down to 64%, I think, in the latest release. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's a rule, you can argue whether it's the, the right rule or not, but the Education Skills Funding Agency can intervene at 62%. And potentially, I mean, it's certainly within their gift, could close a provider down i mean is it is that whole system wrong uh, or is it a case of you know some might perhaps see it there are just too many poor providers still in the system who who, who aren't delivering the complete apprenticeship mm. experience that that leads to that would lead to these higher achievement rates yeah i think that the, the first thing to say is everybody absolutely everybody should be focused on apprenticeships being of the highest possible quality possible and that has to be the quality of delivery, the quality of training, the quality of materials, the quality of the experience. But the current measurements don't really work in the new standard system. So if we measured apprenticeship success rates in the same way that schools were measured for GCSEs or colleges for A-levels or universities for degrees, apprenticeship rates would be up in the 80s or the 90s because With apprenticeships, you're measuring the percentage of people who start compared with those who achieve. Whereas with schools and universities in various forms, it's basically the number of people who have passed their exams or in the university's case, who started and completed the final year of their degree. And what you'll find in apprenticeships is that people don't fail generally. They Mm. drop off and they leave. And the age group, the mean apprenticeship age is still early 20s. People are making life choices. They're not hooked in by the debt of university. They feel freer to move. Employers change their minds. And it's the number of people who leave their program that is causing the drop in apprenticeship success rates, not the outcomes of Mm. those people who get through to the new employment assessment. Yeah. So as you say, actually, there, I I think that's a really well-made point compared to, say, academic sessional qualifications where there's a, you know, it is like a conveyor belt, isn't it? And of course, if you're below the age of 18, you've got no choice but to be on it. And then when you come to the end of the conveyor belt, obviously the government then publishes the stats on the numbers of uh, young people that get you know, five GCSEs, nine to four, you know, the number that get A-levels. And of course, you know, one would like to think, actually, they, they take note also of the number of excellent students that get vocational technical mm-hmm. qualifications as well. Now, the world of employment is 
obviously very different um it's not quite the same type of uh, convey about and as you say grown-up adults will make different decisions employers and indeed employees so what what would make a difference then to the achievement hmm. rates is it about sort of just stripping out if you like per, um, perfectly justified reasons for for example dropping out and then looking at the measure of achievement and then just a final point because i mean again you're hmm. you're all over the detail on this because of um you know the role you've got at kaplan um looking at endpoint assessment i mean surely by definition there's going to be less achievement because less people are achieving first time anyway their competency threshold through the epa i mean again is that something we should think is a bad hmm. thing or is it a good thing surely that was why the whole apprenticeship <laughs> reforms were introduced weren't they well Absolutely. I mean, that's the classic catch-22. And I remember talking about this with, with Doug Richard and others when I was in the, the um, what was the Learning Skills Council, you know, years back to say, do we want to see an increase in failure or success? Because, as you say, if it's too easy and everybody passes, then it seems to be wrong. And if too many people fail, that also seems to be to be wrong. And there isn't the gerrymandering of success rates like there is with GCSEs and other, other programmes. So I would say the move to endpoint assessment independent of the training provider has been critical and crucial and it does give the credibility to the apprenticeships that have somehow and sometimes lacked before when they were kind of on an assessment basis but it also means that a provider should be judged by and the apprenticeship program and an employer of the apprentice should be judged by the number of people who complete the program and then are judged to be of a relevant standard by the independent endpoint assessment body. And that shouldn't be everybody who automatically passes, but it should be, you know, the majority of people who choose the programme, because if they're not competent in the job and if they've not passed the course, they shouldn't be going through gateway. So probably mm-hmm. gateway or endpoint assessment are the relevant points to measure the success of a programme rather than, counting people who drop off and as you say especially when the economy is in such a state of flux if somebody at the moment has to change employers midway through their apprenticeship and that change takes 13 weeks that's classed as a failure how can that be a failure in anybody's eyes if that individual goes back into another employer smashes all their exams and passes everything and his class is a fail it it makes no real sense at all indeed i've got less than a minute left it's always a pleasure talking to you by the way richard i could probably go on for the rest of the show you know to really drill down but just but just um give us a flavor of sort of one thing that you think you know the government should do as as part of you if you like this post covid your kind of recovery plan i mean i appreciate there isn't a magic bullet is there but just tell us one thing you think they should be doing there isn't, but there's three really quick things. They're all, all the right. same thing. First of all, they've got to release the power of the levy. There are billions of unspent pounds in levy accounts that must be spent on apprenticeships, not other things, but must be flexed and freed up. And secondly, we must combine the powers of the independent training market with colleges and the investment that's going into colleges and T levels and not see them all as separate competing programmes. And thirdly, we've got to give employees of this country a reason for employing apprentices this year and next year above all. And as the minister said, the big fear is what's going to happen next year, never mind this year. So those are the the key areas where I think we need to be focusing our energies. Well, as ever, Richard Marsh, Director of Apprenticeships (laughs) at Kaplan, that's pretty clear. Not one thing to do, but three things. Pleasure talking to you this evening. (laughs) Enjoy the show. Thanks a lot. Take care. You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. That was Richard Marsh there. Now, just a reminder that coming up on tomorrow's show, we'll be debating how we prepare for September's new normal. Appearing on the show will be the boss of the Association of Colleges, David Hughes, and the chair of my day job organisation, the Federation of Awarding Bodies, Paul Eels. Don't miss either of those two on the show tomorrow. And if you haven't subscribed by now to the show, it's dead easy. Just go to your favourite podcasting site, like iTunes or Spotify, and hit subscribe. Let's have a short musical break now. And afterwards, we'll be going stateside to talk to the guru of American apprenticeships. Stay tuned.
But sometimes you can't handle your emotions And I guess that's okay Met you at a time when I was so low Went from just talking to taking you home I don't wanna go back to who I used to be So if you ever leave me Promise you won't let me drown Delighted now to go transatlantic and join my good friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Lerman, who's a fellow at the Urban Institute, and indeed he has many roles on the East Coast of the US. And perhaps he'll tell us about some of the things he's up to now. Good evening, Bob. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Stop very well, thanks. Yeah. Here. How's your lockdown going in Washington, D.C.? Uh, well, for me, it's fine, but uh, a lot of people are uh, suffering from job loss, but uh, a lot of people are able to cope. Washington has a lot of office workers, and many of them are able to uh, work remotely. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, the numbers of people in the U.S. economy right now that are filing unemployment insurance claims. I mean, the I mean, the sort of telephone number figures, millions of people have done so since the, the lockdown began. I mean, yeah. as an economist... Yeah, the and, latest report is that... Um, you know, initial claims were typically around 220,000, meaning uh, the first time people would claim, uh, make a claim for unemployment insurance. They jumped to a million in, uh, on the 21st of March to uh, 2.9 million to 6 million. That's 6 million oh, instead of 250,000. So, I mean, it's just um, you know, about astronomical, 13, these numbers. I mean, I, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't, yeah. Is, we're on. talking about 10% of the employed population virtually, um, uh, almost, uh, well, maybe 8%, 8% uh, mm. just in, in a few weeks. So, without taking this closing segment uh, too, too much down into the depths of uh, doom and despair then, I mean, looking ahead, what's your, as an economist, your sort of best guess on where the unemployment rate initially could get to? Because in the Great Recession, unemployment claims were not anything like the level that they are uh, now in the US. And, right. uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, people are talking not just about a Great Recession, but a Great Depression. Well, that would be the case if we uh, continued the shutdown uh, indefinitely. Uh, but... Uh, Lots of states, uh, and even certainly California, which is our largest state, uh, is planning to do some reopening uh, carefully. But nonetheless, uh, they will do some reopening. Uh, some other states that have not been hit hard have already uh, been reopening. And by reopening... Um, it's really widening the range of economic activity that was never totally closed. You have to have people who are doing health care, obviously, uh, food production, food transportation, uh, stocking, 
supermarkets, a whole range of activities. And then, of course, uh, all the people who have been and still are working remotely. But nonetheless, uh, it's been a huge uh, shock. Um, manufacturing is interesting because obviously there's a huge shock in demand. Uh, but some of the problem arises from supply chains. So, for example, uh, I'm told there's an increased demand for forklifts, but some of the companies that are making forklifts, uh, some of their suppliers of parts, uh, were not operating. So um, yeah. the supply chain aspect uh, is important, even if you have some final demand. Yeah. Let's look at the uh, apprenticeship challenge in particular. Now, you know, for those uh, listeners in the UK that aren't familiar with the American apprenticeship system, it's not arguably a national system like it is in England. Uh, it's not certainly as well funded like by things like the levy, and it doesn't have um, uh, universal standards that uh, all employers must adhere to. So you know, the program differs, but still the basic concept of an apprenticeship is a job. The employer has to commit to the individual apprentice who actually tend to be, just like increasingly now in uh, England, tend to be um, older, so certainly over the age of 25 when you look at the average age of uh, US apprentices. As someone that's been an expert on this subject going back uh, quite, you know, a couple of decades or more, um, what do you see as the immediate challenge for the Department of Labor as it, as it, as it grapples with yeah, well, all this? Yeah, well, what, what we, we did some research on the prior recession, and what we found was that um, the big drop-off was in starts, starting new apprenticeships that um, in the typical situation, some people even leave an apprenticeship, but in a recession, uh, because of the absence of other jobs, they would not leave. Now, this is a very different situation because the scale of the downturn has been dramatic. On the other hand, uh, we're hoping that the duration is much shorter. Um, but no, no question that, um, companies are cash poor. They're trying to do anything they can to preserve cash. And that includes, uh, laying off workers. And when you're laying off workers, it's hard to hire new apprentices. Yeah, sure. Now look, I've got just a couple of minutes left and there's one question I definitely wanted to to ask you and before we uh, close this transatlantic call sounds like you got another call coming in there Bob yeah. as well. <laughs> that's probably a rival radio show that wants you probably down in Australia or somewhere anyway what did your perspective on the English apprenticeship reforms um, I mean you closely followed the Richard review you know you've been back and forth to the UK uh, looking at it, uh, our apprenticeship model which is obviously a four country system now what's your sense of, of what's going on with English apprenticeships well my sense is that um, the reforms and even the Institute has paid too little attention to uh, what's required to help companies start apprenticeships and continue apprenticeships. Um, I think they underestimated the extent to which employers on their own will sort of pick up, even with funding of their own uh, from the levy, would pick up and change their HR policies, um, invest in learning about which occupations are best for them, yeah. what's the best way of recruiting apprentices. And uh, you had a system there um, of uh, private and uh, yeah, we've still got private training providers. They're still around along with yeah. the colleges. Yeah, but it sounds like, you know, from what you're the, saying. The colleges yeah. and the uh, private uh, companies, uh, but the incentives for them uh, were cut way back. And so um, I think that's, that's probably, from my perspective, what, uh, what makes it difficult. Now, okay, Bob. on the other hand, you do have a way of incentivizing higher value apprenticeships and uh, maybe too early to tell 
how that will work out. Okay. Well, Bob, when the lockdown ends, maybe we can get you over here and we can do a little uh, symposium Absolutely. with the skills minister <laughs> and with other sector leaders and you can share your pearls of wisdom with us. Bob, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for uh, joining Skills World this evening. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. See you soon. And you. That was Bob Lerman there. Dr. Bob Lerman, who's uh, a fellow at the Urban Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C. Now, this is our closing track of uh, Monday's show, and uh, I didn't really want to close it without just saying a very big thank you to the editor of this show, Kelly O'Mara, but also her mum, who I discovered today, listens to the programme. So, Ruth, down there in Burgess Hill, it's not very far away from me, actually, uh, thank you very much indeed for listening in to Skills World Live. Your daughter's doing a fantastic job. Now, don't forget that if you want to be on the show, contact us at skillsworld at fenews.co.uk. Morning Rises by Arai. Special dedication there to Kelly O'Mara's mum. Also thank the digital producer, Ellie Hansen. Skills World Live is an FE News production supported by the Federation of Awarding Bodies Platinum Partners Programme. Subscribe to Skills World Live at fenews.co.uk forward slash skillsworld. Goodbye.